Welcome to episode 19 of Take Your Points. Uh, this week's guests are uh, Paddy Cunningham from Antrim and Kyle Carville, our, our columnist. So for the first section, we're going to be joined by Paddy Cunningham and we're going to talk about his return to the Saffron Colours. Okay, Paddy, welcome to Take Your Points. Uh, you are obviously on the show this week because we wanted to talk about coming back into county football and sort of what, just generally, what your experiences have been like. But how was it coming back into the team this year? Was it odd? Was it different because it's been so long since you left the squad? I have to say, it was odd coming back into the fold. Um, probably more than anything, it was a real shock to the, the system and a real shock to the body, um, getting back into that level of intensity and the volume of training. Um, obviously, I've still been playing club football, but um, the sheer volume and the sheer level of intensity and, and the levels of fitness required to play county football um, is night and day. I suppose that's it's always been said that county is a different level, but I suppose has, as time has evolved over the last sort of decade, that's become increasingly more prevalent. and. Um, the first few sessions weren't pretty now. Uh, I had wintered well over the last couple of seasons with the club. Um, probably got comfortable, to be, to be honest with you. So I um, had a lot of hard work to do and a lot of hard work to do on my own. And I still have a wee bit to go in terms of that. But um, thankfully, at this stage, hopefully I'm over the worst of it. Whenever you were away from the squad, did you did you miss it? Or did you keep an eye on it? Or you know, what was your... Okay, I was actually saying that I said to my wife probably over the course of what it was six year absence. I think it was maybe a three or four games. I was probably in denial nearly at a stage. I just I couldn't go and watch the games. I know that sounds very selfish, and I just it was probably um, probably my way of realizing in myself that I wasn't finished. You know, um, a young family there, a couple of kids, and psychologically as well. I was just I went for ten, twelve years in the trot. You know, I came into the senior hurling panel under Danny Cahill, and I was just coming out of mine at 18 and had two seasons in the senior hurling team. was obviously playing football and hurling at Jordanstown, um, went into the senior football panel then and that was me right through. So I had very little break playing football and hurling right through from underage level and psychologically I suppose that freshness wasn't there and that hunger and appetite wasn't there and that was probably the main reason I stepped away. So, um, But I suppose the fact that I did struggle to go and watch games was sort of probably something I didn't realise at the time, but it was because I still wanted to be there. Uh, maybe didn't seem to get at that stage, but no, listen, I'm, I'm delighted to be back and hopefully we'll have something to show for it by the end of the year. How did you bat off the, I mean, because managers were obviously coming to you, let me to get back, how did you bat them away? Uh, I was honest, you know, after I took the break the first year, actually Frankfurt Simmons uh, came on as, as the Antwerp senior manager. He's obviously a club man. Um, of La Viarg, the same, same club as myself, so it was probably difficult at that stage to say no uh, to Russ as we would fondly know him as, but probably in my last season under Baker, my performances weren't up to the level of what I, I would feel they, they should have been and that was probably clear for other people to see and it was becoming more mature rather than anything else and I knew if I was going back, I said to Russ, I don't want to go back half-hearted, I don't want to go back and give you 60%, it's either 100% or nothing. So I do generally feel I made the right decision at that stage to step away. Um, probably in reflection, I wish it hadn't been as long before I came back. But I suppose that's just the way time unfolds and the years rolled on. And next thing, it was actually hard to believe. And, uh, I can't remember what journalist was, was able to inform me. It was six years since the last play. But, uh, Listen, a, a great few seasons with the club, you know, I won a club championship, which is something that's very dear to me and maybe that wouldn't have happened if I had been still playing county year upon year and, um, you know, that's something that's very, very sacred to me and it's something that which, which I'll cherish close to me for a long time, hopefully maybe get one, one or two more before. I'd say you yeah, might, so. I'd say you might, the way Antrim's panning out these days, that is a good point, you know, it, it, it could have been a case though if you, you were able to focus on the Love Jurg championship runs, that's what help, might, might have helped me, the difference? Yeah, I, I definitely feel it's, it's good to have, you know, your senior players around the training field, you know, probably if you even look at Corgan last year, pipped us after uh, an epic journey last year, um, you know, they had no county players last year, so I think there's definitely merit in having your your best players and your full panel at, at training, I suppose the, the prime example of that's Kilku, you know, the, the run they went on over particularly this year, you know, very unlucky not to win the Ireland Club Championship and whenever you hear, listen to their lads' interviews after, it's it's all about their club, you know, Down's obviously a fantastic county and great tradition, but their sole heart and sole focus is winning, winning things with their club and it's obviously worked for them well. Coming back into the Antrim County panel, what was that, what was that like? How, 
How odd was it to be sitting in there with those lads after six or seven years? Uh, strange now, obviously, in terms of the age demographic, I was obviously the oldest man coming coming back on board. Uh, but, you know, thankfully, I have to say, in terms of the management and the players, they were, they were very welcome and made me feel very comfortable very quickly. Uh, obviously, Declan Lynch is a good friend of mine. He's captain this year. and. Alexa like Paddy McBride and, and Al Delargy and those boys, you, you have played against them for years um, at club level and a lot of Ricky Johnson, Marty Johnson were all there when I w was last playing with the county so I have to say the boys have been fantastic and welcome not only myself but um, Tomas McCann back and, and obviously over recent weeks Michael as well so to be honest it was really quickly getting back into the swing of things and it didn't feel as long um, from the last time I was there and, and involved in the setup. How do, do you deal with that commitment? You know, because players have said that it's very difficult to play county football at the top level. How do you balance it? Lenny, to be fair to him, you know, was one of the main catalysts for getting me back. I um, met him a couple of times um, and I like what I heard. He, you know, he understands the, the equipment required and obviously everybody's situations are, are different in terms of if you're a student, you have a lot more free time. I'm obviously uh, working full time of a young family and uh, a lot of other commitments. So, you know, Lenny was, has been flexible in terms of his approach. Um, he understands in terms of the fact there may be an odd training session which I'm going to make due to my wife obviously works shift work as well. So sometimes she's working uh, overnights and stuff. So Lenny, you know, he said the right things. And But at the same time, as I said to Lenny, if I do commit, I want to be as every session. And to be honest, luckily enough, um, to the help of grandparents and everything else, I haven't missed too much. Um, I think it's important too that you're at every session. You know, um, with the best will in the world, you know, circumstances do come up where you maybe have to miss the, a training session now and again. But if you're going to be serious about the thing and you want to give it the, the respect it deserves, and you know, you get shown up very quickly if you're not putting the work in. And um, thankfully, I've been able to attend most of the sessions as as well as the other lads who he sort of made the same arrangement with. It was like, uh, I promise you this and promise you that, but it ended up we bought in fully anyway, so it didn't really matter, you know. <laughs> What's it like to have the like the mix like some Mick and Tomas there who you know well from going back? Is it? It's great, you know. I probably played ten, twelve years with with Mick and uh, in particular we played Manor obviously together and under twenty one. So getting him back over the last couple of weeks is great. I'll have a I'll have a partner in the bus now um, with the same interest at all in uh, these young lads. But uh, no, it's been great to have Tomas and Mick back and. And in a pure sporting sense, you know, Mick McCann's a Rolls Royce. He, he's he's uh, he's been there, done it. Um, still keeps himself in fantastic condition, um, and I think it's been testament to bring him back already. Based on the last two games, you know, he came on for I think 20 minutes against Carlo and really steadied the ship, and showed that wealth of experience he has. And again, he came on at half time yesterday and, and made a major impact. And hopefully now Tomas is two weeks now to Wicklow. Um, he had to go through minor surgery there, but he's pushing hard as well. And I would fully expect him to, to push for a place in the 26 uh, for the Wicklow game. How have you found the game when you come back? Has it changed much the way football's played and the way you play? Oh, it's changed dramatically, you know, even though it was only six years. But in terms of the science behind it, the attention to detail is frightening. I think maybe when we were with Liam, we maybe had two or three in our backroom team and maybe um, sort of logistics man, whereas maybe eight, nine, ten now, involved even within the autumn team, never mind the bigger counties or perhaps maybe need a separate bus for, for their backroom team. But the attention to detail is frightening. Uh, the analysis that goes in, the, the preparation work, you know, and in ways we're actually spoilt. You know, everything's given to you. Obviously, we have to do the work on the pitch, but in terms of the background information and the analysis of both your own performance and the opposition's performance, it, it's incredible. And as well as that, the major difference I've noticed is, is within the training, you know, used to be one set, one training session for the whole squad, whereas now you see a lot more separation, the defenders maybe going with the defensive coach, forwards going with the forwards coach, which is something which I would really never really experienced, to be honest with you, uh, on my previous tender with Autumn. So it was fascinating the first couple of weeks, to, to, be, to be totally honest with you. Obviously, everything's moved on, club levels, obviously, a lot more... Um, um, sort of scientific and a lot more professional than what it used to be but no, it, it, the game has definitely definitely moved on dramatically and it'll be interesting to see where it goes because there's not much more room I don't think <laughs> it's the small margins <laughs> I think we'll talk more about Antrim and, and how Antrim are going this year whenever we get Kyle in but thanks very much for that that was a good no chat interesting no bother. So welcome, Cal. Uh, thanks for coming in. We wanted to start by talking about the uh, Darlith Burns missing out on the presidency favourite. He was supposed to be favourite and missed out by, to Larry McCarthy. 
what was your take on that? Was it a surprise to you or um, did you see this coming? Well, I suppose the first point is that the sense of disappointment in the county was palpable. And there was a lot of people actually, not only disappointment, I think it probably extended to a slight bit of anger around it. Jarrath known him personally, a great Gael, um, a great club man, and I think not only um, the GM members in my own county, but in all of Ulster were hoping that Jarrath would have got the job. And I suppose his age profile as well, you know, his commitment to his club, you know, what he's done in the past, but also the fact that he's a principal in a school and he sort of knows what the future of the, the GA is around. Because if you think about it, you know, it's they won't be starting for another year and there's a three year term so we're talking four years on in terms of um, where he'll get the chance to, to go again. Was I surprised ultimately that um, he didn't get the role? No, I wasn't. Um, from what I had heard coming out ahead of Congress was that Jarrett wasn't going to get it. He was a favourite um, but a lot of people had been saying to me that there's no chance he's going to get it on this occasion. Now. What sort of re reasoning behind that? Is it vested interests? Is it lobbying? Had he not played the political game as well? Maybe he, w he hadn't had the background that some of the other um, guys, especially Larry McCarthy, had in terms of that administration role and coming up through the ranks. But I think it was a backward decision from uh, the GEA. But not only that, the, the fact that Larry McCarthy and a lot of people have been eulogising about his you know sports science and his sport marketing background and his education, which is good, but is that actually where the association needs to go now? In my mind, it shouldn't be going to the raising the profile, marketing it from a corporate commercial point of view. It should be focusing back on the clubs, on the grassroots, and encouraging support from that perspective, as opposed to taking it down a purely corporate role, which potentially is the indication given by um, the appointment of, of Laurie. So extremely disappointed for Jardeth, um, I suppose from my own county and a, a personal level, but I wasn't surprised. Yeah, well, Paddy, what was your take on it? Disappointed to see Ulsterman miss out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Jardeth's a great Gael. He's a, he was a legend both on and off the field. Um, so from an Ulster perspective, uh, many moons ago, Jardeth was actually my art waster in the Gael tack. So, you know, his, his pedigree is phenomenal. But I suppose at the end of the day, everybody can't win. Um, you know, Larry's got the job now, so he's a lot to live up to. Uh, so we'll see how it pans out. You know, Cahill mentioned there, obviously, his background. You know, he's a professor. He's, his pedigree in terms of uh, the education of sport and the development of sport is phenomenal. So, you know, he has an opportunity there. but. At the end of the day, the GA still needs Jarlath Burns and Larry McCarthy will need Jarlath Burns. So I feel um, Jarlath will be back, no doubt, um, at some stage and I have no doubt in the future he will be GA president. So, but in the interim, it would be great to see Jarlath Burns being involved in the inside prior to that appointment, um, being involved uh, in central decisions at, at grassroots level and in terms of the development of club um, level and also ensuring that the grassroots issues are addressed and it's not all about, as Cahill says, the, the future development of the corporate side of the GA, which is obviously um, doing very well as it is. I do feel Larry McCarthy will add to that tremendously, but it can't be to the detriment of what the GA is all about in terms of its grassroots participation, the clubs uh, and, and its members. One of the issues that Jarrett probably could have been overseeing would have been Caseman Park opening up, but uh, at the moment, it just—it still seems like it's struggling on. You've been a big proponent, obviously, for getting case was open. What do you think? Do you think are, are we closer, or are we further away, or? Uh, we... I suppose we need to wait in the planning decision, which, um, by all accounts, is due over the next few weeks. Um, and um, I have no doubt that there could be issues, uh, even if pa uh, planning is passed. Um, I know, obviously, everybody's concerns need to be listened to, and obviously, there's a residence committee there who who have. Um, their opinions on and issues surrounding the size and the scale of it. Um, but from a GA point of view, from both as a parent of a boy who asked me recently, what is this Caseman Park? You know, he's heard so much about it and seen it in the news. He's now six years of age, has never been stepped foot in it. So first of all, from a parent point of view, I would hope to see my son play there <laughs> sooner or later. later. Um, sort of grasping on the, the master's chance for myself at this stage. <laughs> but no, listen, uh, Belfast needs Caseman Park. The GA within Antrim uh, needs Caseman Park, it needs an identity. You know, we played um, Limerick yesterday and there was two kids team playing on Pork and Owens pits at, at half time. Now if those boys are playing in Caseman Park, so whatever occasion it would be for those boys and you know, the future of our youth 
a lot depends on Casement Park. You know, as a teacher, I'm seeing more and more kids step towards soccer, uh, and I have no issue with soccer. My son, my own son plays it, but at the same time, you know, the, they're seeing Windsor Park, they're seeing the Northern Ireland team training uh, week in, week out over at Queen's Playing Fields, and they're seeing the spectacle, which is Windsor Park when they're travelling to the city centre. Casement at, at the moment is a disgrace. Um, in hindsight, they probably should have kept it open until planning was passed, but listen, what's done is done. We need to move forward now, and um, hopefully the decision will be made in case it will be, will be up and going as soon as possible. There's a, there's a wider issue also in relation to case in terms of the, the economical factor. You know, it's going to be much more than just the GAA stadium. It could be a venue for concerts or sporting events, you know, such as like, you know, you've Michael Conlon fight, fighting in film football last year. You know, it could be a world, world boxing championship fights for all our fighters, not just Michael Conlon. Uh, and the Anderson Town Road in Belfast. So it's, it's an amazing opportunity and it's something which hopefully will come to fruition sooner or later. You don't see it being any, you know, at the moment they're talking about reducing the size of it. I know people are talking about it, but, they, but they, the GA say it can't be any smaller. What do you say? Do you say it has to be that number? I feel so, yeah. You know, you have to reach for the stars. You know, it's 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 a statement of what the GA is about and what what they're trying to, to achieve. You know, obviously we've got the funding now for Galefast. Um, as well from Crook Park, which is which is going to be invaluable. Hopefully, we'll see that gaining more success both on and off the pitch. But I feel you know, in order for it to hold Ulster semi-finals, Ulster finals, maybe international games, potentially rugby games, um, you know, I feel it needs to be that size. Um, you know, we look around the country and we look at all our uh, provincial stadiums, huge capacities, and why should we be any different? Rugby games, Paddy, foreign games in the Casement Park. So, so it happened in Crook, so they know different in Casement. <laughs> What was the highlight for you playing at Cruise, uh, in Casement Park? Um, probably my first game senior football championship for my club. I uh, played obviously many Antrim games there, but uh, I was 17, I think, when I made my senior club debut. And um, probably half the size I am now, now, not that I've got much bigger. But probably my first club senior championship game is my most abiding memory running down those steps. Um, for the first time, something which will always live with me and something I'll always cherish. It's crazy. To see, it's crazy. This doesn't. I just. It was so. It was so easy. I just always going over to West Belfast just to go up to the Casement Park. You just assumed it would always be there. Yeah. Like, Cal, what was your? Do you have a memory of Casement Park? Yeah, I do. A very uh, vivid memory in 2011 when Armagh contested the first um, Ulster hurling championship final in um, since 1943. I think it was. Um, where we we ran a, a Denny Cahill led Antrim uh, quite close that day, and that was a massive statement for our mass where we would go in the next couple of years, and also in terms of encouraging the young the youth uh, within our to, to you know to pick up a hurl. So that was a really um, you know one of my uh, abiding memories from my career, and it's I have to say the actual field itself. Uh, having played in Crow Park and having played in some of the top stadiums um, in, in Ireland, uh, Casement Park is the best that I've played on and um, you know it's uh, with Stormont coming back up and running um, I, I think it's uh, it's certainly positive in relation to where things are going and I think Casement Park will be a, a massive benefit to not only uh, uh, the community in West Belfast on all, uh, in the whole of Belfast and also in Ulster and I think it's going to be a focal point for um, sport and success going forward. One of the big things for Casement Park was the McCoy Cup final. The McCoy Cup was like many years of memory of going there to see Mahara play. It was a great venue, a great crack, always had at it. But that won't be there this year, Paddy, because it's still closed. But uh, it's this year, it's St. Coleman's and uh, Mahara and another two old boys. What did you take of seeing those two teams in the final? It's uh, more of the same? More of the same, yeah. But they're obviously the serious tradition within the competition and the probably both convincing wins last over the last week. Um, but, you know, they live and breathe. McCrory football in both schools. Um, I still feel it's a very, very important day in the calendar in terms of uh, the GA within Ulster. You know, personally, I feel schools football really develops boys to go back to their club. Um, not everybody will have the privilege of playing county minor, but the work that they get from their from their teachers at McCrory level is second to none. And I know even um, Cal mentioned they're playing in, in casement as well. We played McLaren finals in casement. And, I know the development I got, even playing McLaurin, which is obviously B football, 
um, was, was excellent for me developing as a footballer and I think it's something which needs to be cherished and, and nurtured and given the respect it deserves and it needs to continue. Do you think McLaren and football, or how did it help you to move on to play county football? Probably, being honest with you, playing Antrim club football at that level, you know, it was relatively easy at, at your age group. You know, you're maybe two or three good players within each team. However, when it came to McLaren and football, even at B level, you were playing other schools from um, Derry, Armagh, Donegal. Um, you know, it raised, it raised the bar. You know, you were playing maybe the best two or three players out of each club, making up their school team. So I think the level the level of football for me personally was the best level I got until I reached county minor level, bar none. It was very, very easy to see for me personally the step up and where I needed to get to to try and progress as a footballer. You know, you maybe think you're, you're doing okay at your own club and within your own, you know, South Antrim League, so to speak. Um, but it was a real step up and it was something that probably made, made me realise that, listen, you've a lot of work to do if you want to continue to push on. Right. C Kyle, did you sort of agree with that? The, the thing about the McCrory and having played with my own schools in Pots Armagh, um, we haven't, I suppose, in recent uh, years. Uh, we've contested semi-finals, maybe quarter-finals. We have to go back to Sean Cameron and Ronan Clark and the 2000 team before uh, for the last time that we won it. But it's not only the sporting side of things, it's the discipline that it applies, you know, it's the work ethic. And I can speak for myself, I come from, uh, you know, a rural club, Middlehound, that had no lineage in terms of uh, football and I suppose known rightly as a, as a hurling club. But when I went to St. Pat's, that's what brought me on to another level, but not only just in terms of sporting, but also in terms of realising what it takes to be successful and that's not just on the football pitch or on the hurling field or I suppose now with some parts of the basketball court but also in terms of your studies as well because you had that uh, regimented days okay I need to plan out what I'm going to do and I can have a couple of hours to study here it brings you on not only as a footballer not only as an athlete but as a, a human being and I think McCrory Cup some of the best days of my life and I'll always cherish and uh, remember those days um, um, maybe not so much when uh, Martin Clark scored the goal that knocked us out uh, against Kilkeel um, going back to 2005. But at the end of the day, they're memories I hold dear and I think the McCrory is as important now as it ever was. Do we feel that there's a squeeze on schools football, you know, with the, with the, you know, the, 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 the schedule, the season schedule? They do want to play it, they're trying to push them back. Why do they have to have it before Christmas? You know, why do they play the league stages before Christmas and then the finals afterwards? Uh, and uh, these days, the GA just wants the uh, competition to be finished quicker. quicker. To be fair, from, from a teacher's point of view, you can understand why they have brought it to before Christmas, because obviously, you know, these boys are doing A-levels and you're trying to get them to university. So, you know, obviously, you know, traditionally it was on St. Patrick's Day, which is March time, but in terms of the way the dynamic of A-levels and applied courses have changed, they may be sitting exams, you know, at Easter time or in January. So. It, it does give them a focus in terms of their studies as well. Um, it's just unfortunate in terms of the weather conditions at this time of year and the issues with pitches and everything else. You know, logistically, from from school games over the last few weeks, there's been it's been a headache trying to get a pitch available. And you're you're playing games in 3G pitches, um, which is great for hurling because the ball moves really well. But you know, ideally, you want to be playing on a grass pitch. So I can understand from the college's point of view, um, you know, bringing the games before Christmas to, to try and get them played, get the competition um, uh, completed prior to exam season, so to speak. But, you know, there's obviously also the issue, particularly with St. Pat's Mahara and all our schools have found this with the St. Paul's Minor Tournament, which is an incredible uh, tournament, which, um, you know, which is a, pl a privilege to play for your club and that competition obviously my own club on it and that's the sort of the backbone of our senior team at the moment so you know players have been either not playing for their school because they've been playing for their club and there's been a lot of issues surrounding that so I feel even in terms of that if they could run the St Paul's tournament off prior to the commencement of the, the McCrory Cup as well would help but it's important that um, the McCrory gets the credit it deserves and as Cahill mentioned you know it's it, they, they are the memories that stand with you you know Probably your school's football and your university uh, football in Hurling is probably two of your most fun memories, as, as we mentioned and as we talked about earlier. Speaking of memories, the memories of the weekend of uh, National League football would have been the Tyrone Dublin punch up in um, Healy Healy Park. Uh, what did you take? What did you make of that? Is it handbags or uh, was it just two teams that were? 
passionate and wanted to win. It was. Uh, I was actually watching the game in the house on Saturday evening. It was. It was strange because there was no real bite or intensity to the first half. It, it came out of nowhere, really. Um, obviously, it's not something we want to see, especially when the game's being televised. And um, there's probably younger members of the association watching it at that time on a Saturday evening. But listen, at the end of the day, these things happen. But it's probably getting a solution to the problems. The main thing that you need to look look at, you know, there's obviously rules and protocol for teams that are in the pits before a game. So it's you know it's very easy sorted in my opinion. Um, one team goes in first, the other one waits. The exact same the way it is coming out onto the field. You know if that happens, it cuts out all that. You know at the end of the day, stadiums are built um, a long time ago. There's only one way in, one way out into a lot of the county ground. So to alleviate that problem, just go back to the same protocol that it's here to for entrance onto the pitch. There's two minutes separation or one minute, whatever it is. Uh, and God forbid anything does happen, you know, punish the teams that are involved in it uh, as soon as they come back out. I don't know whether it's issuing black cards to their captain or there's a set protocol or set rule for that, but I think the easiest, most transparent way to do it is first out goes first in at half time and vice versa. Yeah, the uh, the Throne got the result. I don't know who won the fight, but the Throne got the result. Uh, a important one for them, Carl. You know. Yeah, well, I think it was extremely important, especially given the hiding that they they got the week before um, by Galway, and I tipped Galway as my uh, potential All Ireland winners in this program a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to rerun that um, a bit of film when they win it. But just to pick up on the fisticuffs, is, and I think to be honest, they have been maybe brushed under the carpet in in relation to it. And I think the GA needs to come down really hard on both teams in this one. Absolutely, I said it before on any of the the video footage that have been fights in my own county and in other counties um, as well where maybe they've been let off. There's going to be somebody with a serious injury. We've uh, looked at it before in terms and we have written articles before on the fact that these come before the courts. Um, where there's been punches thrown and this is not something that we should laugh about oh wasn't that great crack and uh, did you see that um, right? It's bringing the, the game into disrepute and it's not something that we should be encouraging. Like. It wasn't uh, a month ago that we had the All-Iron Club final and that debacle after the full time when um, Cor Finn and the um, Kilku boys uh, came uh, both running in at the same time and it caused the same issue. So, as Paddy says, it's easily dealt with, but in relation to Tyrone and Dublin, going back to the Battle of Oma, everyone laughs about it, and Kieran Whelan was joking about it last night, but it's we should not be encouraging this and we should make a statement with both Tyrone and Dublin going forward after what happened at the weekend. Just to really wrap it up, I wanted to ask you just what was the highlights from the weekend and what are the highlights so far? Obviously, you're pleased with how Antrim are going, Paddy? Yeah, it was great when against, obviously, Limerick were sitting top of the table going into yesterday's game. Still very much nip and tuck. Um, there's a lot of teams in contention, but probably still disappointed a wee bit with previous results in terms of the one point defeat to Sligo and the draw with Carlo. But at the end of the day, the win yesterday puts it back in our hands. If we win our last two games, um, we'll get promoted. So, still a lot of work to be done. Wicklow have had a bit of form over the last couple of games. Waterford as well. So, there's still a lot to play for. But I think it's interesting to note just how competitive each and every league is. You know, there's one or two points, maybe three, four points separating top to bottom. So, it's definitely uh, a very enjoyable time of year for uh, supporters and both players because every game matters um, and every game is competitive. Um, you know, maybe that's the difference, major difference between the national leagues. You know, every league's competitive, in contrast to maybe where there's different mismatches within the championship structure at times. So, from an Adam point of view, yes, we've put ourselves in a place where we can push on. Um, it's up to us to now go and, uh, and try and get a result against Wicklow down there, which will be far from easy. So, it's in our hands. Um, we don't want to be dependent on our team's results from a personal perspective. But I think overall, in the course of the National League, it's 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 fierce competitive and it's great to see um, from Division 1 right through to Division 4. Yeah. Larry McCarthy in his new role could learn a lot from the Antrim PRO, Sean Kelly, because what he's doing in terms of promoting the sport in Antrim, um, it's brilliant and it's worth uh, following him on Twitter for that there. So I congratulate him on what he's doing. Uh, I thought the point you were going to make was Rory Began. You quickly <laughs> called out Rory Began a couple of weeks ago about his performances and he didn't have a bit of a shocker there at the weekend. Yeah, well, I think as I put up on my own Twitter uh, keepers are, are should be in nets and I was referred to old Benny Tierney you know back to nets Benny you know that's why you're there so yes uh, Morgan at the weekend maybe uh, made me eat my words a wee bit but uh, yeah certainly Rory Beckin should uh, focus more on the goalkeeping and maybe not the kicks from 70 yards. All right well thanks very much Paddy for coming in thanks Kat for coming in as well appreciate the chat. No problem. Thank you.